I see everything. I know there's everything. Well, you haven't seen you got some crackers up on your chin. How about that? It's mm. being sticky. Hey, welcome back Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy, and I want to talk to you guys about Loki Episode 3 and give you my thoughts on the episode. I got a big theory about the Ravona secret that was teased at the end of the episode. I know a really big one about you. And a little later, I'm going to be joined by two of my favorite Marvel experts. We have our own Colton Ogburn and Heather Antos to get their thoughts and theories. But first, here's my take. Guys, I am falling hard <laughs> for this season of Loki. I love the new additions to the cast. I love all the timey-wimey logic and the theory crafting, and especially the stellar performances from this all-star cast. This season has been so much fun to watch, and we have had a blast designing Loki-inspired shirts for our merch store at ScreenCrushMerch.com. Especially the latest, this super creepy Miss Minutes, I Can Be Your Girl. Your girl. We've got lots of others like the variant hoodie, the usual variant shirt, Ms. Minutes Dolly Clock, and more. Shopping our merch store is the best way for you to support our channel. This is not my channel, this is our channel, and thank you so much for supporting us and making us what we are. So, for me, this season of Loki has all the benefits of Marvel TV with almost none of the drawbacks. It is connected to the wider universe. But, like, it's off doing its own thing. You don't need to have seen Quantumania to understand what's happening in this show. It's also really expanded its scope past season one. Like, I love season one, but in hindsight, it felt and looked a bit cheap. The department store in 2050 was exactly like a department store you'd see in 2021. The Renaissance era trip ended up being a fake out rent fair to the 1980s. Even the alien world was just a desolate wasteland. But this season feels bigger. Episodes one and two showed more expansive TVA sets, and they also introduced us to new levels and threats within the building. The 1970s London setting was convincing, but really they blew it apart this week. They meticulously recreated the Chicago World's Fair right down to the period perfect background posters. I mean, this show is like an anti-secret invasion. What do you mean by that? Well, look, I don't want to keep beating up on that show, especially now that we know about its many behind-the-scenes problems that we've covered in, like, these videos. Secret Invasion was the victim of forced reshoots, infighting, lack of creative direction out of the gate, and most especially corporate interference. But, I mean, look at these two shows. In a lot of ways, they're very similar. They return two world-class, charismatic MCU actors as part of a buddy cop duo, and then they bring in Oscar-winning actors like ki Hu Kwan, and Olivia Coleman to add their chemistry into the story. Now, Olivia Coleman was wonderful as Sonia. Alone at last. Now, shall we do this the easy way or the other way? But really, she didn't have a lot to do. Like, if you would have taken her out of that story, it wouldn't have really mattered that much. While OB is at the center of this new season of Loki and his presence actually keeps teasing something larger, maybe something more threatening. Secret Invasion also felt very cheap with sparse hospital sets, small rooms, and like questionable, let's just be kind and say questionable visual effects. But this show, Loki, feels expansive, like we can travel to any time and place and the TVA feels like this massive labyrinth that we can never fully explore. But Secret Invasion also did not make sense within its own universe. Like Thanos was living on an abandoned planet, so why couldn't the Skrulls have just lived there? How long was Rhodey a Skrull? How did Fury collect everybody's blood? Is Gaia the most powerful hero now? Why didn't Fury call the Avengers? Why did they waste a great crossover from the comics when it could have been so good as an Avengers movie? I person? Yeah, buddy? You're getting Secret Invasion mad again. Sorry, man. Hey, person, why do you got that tiny Loki on the counter? Oh, Doug, this is much more than a tiny Loki. This is a present Loki collectible from Collector Zone, the sponsor of this video. Right, whatever is Collector Zone. Well, Collector Zone is a unique company that focuses on high-end collectibles, like a luxury car dealership, but for nerds. I mean, like, they work with companies like Sideshow Collectibles, Hot Toys, Iron Studios, and dozens more. But what makes this company so unique is that they have a five-star approach to interacting with their members. But they also have an actual physical gallery full of items that you could go check out for yourself in person. Here is a video of the gallery with thousands of items for members and potential members to see in person. Like when I saw this place, my jaw hit the floor. Look at the scale and detail of some of these collectibles. Like this Loki model that recreates President Loki from episode five of season one. Look at the detail on this thing. You have stitching in the rug, the bowling pins. It perfectly reenacts that scene. Like look, it's even got, you can see the stitching in the code exactly where it was in the show. So how do I 
I become a member? Do I got to sign something? I will sign anything you want. No, dude, it, it's nothing like that. To become a member, you join the Collector Zone Cantina page on Facebook. Then, once you join, the owner, Marcos, will welcome you to the company. Marcos has also offered Screen Crush members a 15% off discount for anything you want on the website if you use the code Screen Crush. And this code expires at the end of the Loki series. Now, guys, look, this code offers potentially huge savings, so you don't want to miss out. It's only good for just a few more weeks. So, check out the link below to get your collectibles today. Now, back to Loki. So, look, those are all the problems of Secret Invasion, but this show, Loki, is fitting perfectly within its own little pocket of the MCU. Like I said earlier, you don't really need to have seen a lot of the MCU to follow this story. They've kept their focus on Loki, Mobius, and Sylvie trying to navigate this helter-skelter scenario that they find themselves in. And I also want to point out the adaptation factor here. Like, Marvel is in a pretty bad losing streak where they're wasting great ideas from the comics, like the Illuminati, Gore, Secret Invasion. All were not adapted well. But Loki is the opposite. It's making the comics better. Like, the TVA in the comics is fun, but it's more of a gag about how Marvel's editors kept track of rigid continuity across all the different comics. But this show has taken that loose concept, adapted it, and woven it perfectly into the fabric of the MCU. Now, I am curious how they can take a show this complicated and apply it to a general audience movie like Avengers The Kang Dynasty, and I'm going to ask Heather and Colton about that later. And man, Jonathan Majors is so great in every part. Like, I'm trying to withhold any judgment on him until his day in court, but you can see why Marvel decided that he was the guy to hang the multiverse saga on. I really feel like every version of Kang that he has played is a totally different person. And if Victor Timely is an early version of Kang, or of He Who Remains, then God, what a character arc he's going to have. But the heart of the show is Loki and Mobius, and now they've broadened that to include Sylvie, and OB is just delightful. We're all gonna die still. And this episode did a great job of using Sylvie with the small amount of screen time that she had. Like, they focused on her conflicting ideals. When she looked at Victor Timely, begging for his life, she just saw another variant like herself. And Ravona is actually a lot more nuanced here than she was last season. She went from being a timekeeper shield to somebody who's actually searching for her place in the universe. Her single-minded devotion is like how fascists like Kang rise to power. Now, a lot of people think this season's confusing, but like, I love time travel stories, so I am here for it. Like, this episode spawned a lot of theories and questions. What's going on with OB? Is this version of Kang, like the Kang at a younger age? Is this all still part of He Who Remains plan? What's the deal with Miss Minutes and Ravona? In fact, I got a theory on that which explains everything that I'm going to tell you in just a bit. But first, let me bring on our guests. So we have our own Colton Ogburn, who, by the way, is the guy who's trapped eternally in our tiny television, but he does not know it, so please don't tell him. And we have Senior Group Editor of Licensing at IDW, Heather Antos. So, Heather, we haven't talked to you about Loki yet this season. You know, what are your thoughts on Episode 3 and the season thus far at the midway point? Yeah, so I will be up front and, and say that uh, while I do think that Loki season one and season two is probably one of the best crafted uh, shows of the MCU that we've seen so far in Disney+, Plus, um, it just is not a show for me. Uh, and that's just my personal tastes on I uh, really dislike time travel stories just in and of a whole. Um, my brain just gets too into the logic weaves and on how time travel just always ends up contradicting itself in, in some way, shape and form. And, and I just get very angry. Um, <laughs> but having that been said, I will watch Owen Wilson and Tom Hiddleston uh, watch paint dry. I could, you know, I, I would pay to do that. I think they're two of the most charismatic, talented actors um, working in Hollywood today. So to get to see them, um, spend so much time together every week is just is just a joy. Um, Colton, how about you? How did episode three work out for you? Well, I really enjoyed episode three, and I, I've enjoyed the season. I enjoyed the first season. I, I'm like Heather. I'm not a time travel fan at all. I, <laughs> time travel oh, is always... I still am. I love time I know. travel stories. I, know. I love them. I, I'm kind of in that same boat, though, of like... I start to overthink it, and I'm like, that makes no sense, and then I can't enjoy it anymore. But... I've I've always been a fan of multiverse type stuff. And so when Marvel, you know, introduced these two concepts together, what they did with Endgame, what they're doing with Loki, I, I think they've actually handled it really well. And so I've enjoyed it. Uh, this episode in particular, I, I really liked it. I love the buddy cop feel, like I've mentioned before, with Mobius and Loki. Um, I liked that this episode, and this is something that you can do with television, that they took a moment to remind us as the audience and like through Mobius when they were looking at those Norse God statues and Mobius is like, you know, sometimes I forget that you're one of them. When yeah. I watched that scene, I was like, 
I kind of forget that he's one of them too, because this is he's not like a different character at this point. Yeah, yeah. This yeah. is not a Norse god Asgard type show. And then I'm like, oh, I am watching a show about the god of mischief. So I, I like that they took the time to do that. Uh, we have met what our third. Well, I guess we've met a lot of Kang variants in the post credit scene to Quantum Mania, but now we've like really got to meet like a, and spend a lot of time with a version of Kang with Victor Timely. Um, my hope is that Kang will one day be a very just, you know, feared villain in the MCU like Thanos. But I love that they were, you know, they've taken this, you know, leap and uh, were willing to show us this clumsy, like stuttering, like, you know, just kind of goofy, lighthearted version with Victor Timely. I, I really enjoyed that. And Miss Minutes was terrifying as usual. <laughs> <laughs> so terrifying, which yes. just a reminder, we have our terrifying I Can Be Your Girl Miss Minutes pinup shirt for sale at our merch store, ScreenCrushMerch.com. So uh, when the, the shirt that's either going to literally make us or break us. Um, <laughs> you know, it's talking about Kang, right? We had this theory in our Easter egg video I talked about earlier that this is not a variant of He Who Remains as Ravona seems to think. This is, in fact, He Who Remains origin story, right? And we had this whole timey-wimey theory where he had to create a branching timeline to create himself so the TVA couldn't exist, so he's in this Ouroboros loop. That aside, right, looking at this episode, it is easy to see why Marvel looked at Jonathan Major's performances and said, geez, this guy, let's, let's build something around this guy. So many problems, you know, I'm trying to withhold judgment, see how the court case pans out, things like that. And, and, and I'm not a legal channel and I can't speak to any of that stuff, but performance-wise, this guy really does a great job of making you see these as different people. You know, it's not like he's doing an impression or a silly accent. Heather, what about you? Is this, you know, if we can remove the personal and legal component and what are we, our feelings of him regardless, is this a big bad on the scale of Thanos that we're looking at? Oh, I think it's a big, bigger bad. Jonathan Majors is a, a Yale graduate, Yale drama school graduate. You know, that is mm -hmm. the creme de la creme of, of theater training and boy is marvel making the most of that with with this mm -hmm. actor he is absolutely killing it in every single scene that he is in and um i think you know this is this is someone who has nothing to lose and everything to lose and those Victor timely yes Mm -hmm. um and kang you know the the who who we see him mm -hmm. become and all the different versions of him and those are the scariest villains to me um because nothing will stop them nothing will get in their way you know uh, but as we've seen that ego is the only thing that gets in their way and often is is what befalls them so um you know i i'm very much looking forward to where they go with this character in the Kang Dynasty. I think I'm honestly way more excited about that than I ever was with anything with Thanos. I think Thanos was a very um, cool first step for the MCU, like first big bag. Mm -hmm. But but mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the day, you know, he was just a man with a glove. Um <laughs> Right. Who sat who sat down a lot. Who really sat uh, down so much. I, love, I always loved I think I mentioned this in our in game Easter egg video and thank all twelve million of you for watching. Uh, I mentioned how twenty fourteen Thanos sat on his ass and let other people do all the work and like in Guardians and then he immediately does that when he gets back in Endgame. Because he has not yet said, Fine, I'll do it myself. Yeah. And Jesus his, did he take his time. <laughs> he really did. Ten years. He really did. You know, and this thing with, with uh, Victor Timely I'm watching him and I'm thinking like, this is if we would have gotten to have seen Thanos's, you know that great comic uh, where we see Thanos growing up mm -hmm. and on Titan and we actually see how he becomes the, the, mm -hmm. the, the lover of death and things like that. And the MCU, it's interesting to watch their evolution of villains because we did see this pretty hard turn toward nuance and motivation, you know, after Loki was so well received in the yes. first Thor movie. We had a lot of one note villains before and after Loki and they even tried to imbue Thanos with, oh, he's an eco-terrorist. The logic doesn't hold up at all, because I've seen all these like models where it's like 60 years after the snap, everything would have been the same. But still, they tried. With this guy, I'm looking at him and going, wow, you are, you are truly at your lowest point when you start, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like, I mean, 
all the makings of who he is to be, we, we see it in that moment, right? When he's on the boat mm-hmm. and he drops drops Winslayer off off the lifeboat into the, you know, mm-hmm. and Miss Timely's like, it had to be done. You know, and even when he talks about his dreams, yeah. Exactly. Even when he talks about his dreams and he talks about the divine hand that gave this to me, he, he really feels like he is the one, you know? And if you go back to that theory that I said earlier, right? Let's say this is correct, um, that he had to create a branching timeline so he could exist, right? That's why the TVA had to be temporarily defunct to allow a branching timeline. In the Loki season one finale, he says, I've run all the calculations. This is the only way this can happen. If, if our theory is true, then that's not true because he could simply not cause the branching timeline. He could simply be a poor candle maker in the 1800s and that would have been his life but because of his his like nascent desire to rule and to prove he's great and to prove everybody wrong we saw that in this episode i think it's a great observation and i think it makes kank a very dynamic character and going back to what colton said uh about loki how we kind of forget where he started heather are you is there you buying into that aspect of like Tom Hiddleston that like the Loki that we saw in the Avengers and the Loki we saw now it's the same character who's on, on like a believable arc? You know, it, that is a really interesting question. I it's something I try not to think too much on uh, because I really do love the Loki that we see here um, in the show, and and um, I, I do hope that old Loki is still in there and he comes out, you know, they, they wanted to hint at that, I think in episode two, a little bit, right. When we saw his abilities and, um, and the interrogation scene and, and all of that. Um, but you know, he is the God of mischief and the God of chaos. And I do think we've lost a little bit of that. Um, it does make me wonder, you know, like he was on Asgard for how many hundreds of years being this like crazy jokey prankster dude. And then Mm -hmm. this like, you know, the small 15 year span, that's enough to change like intimately who this, this God is less, right. Less, less than that. From the time of Thor to the time of the Avengers is probably a year. That's true. Yeah. So, guess, yeah. so like that's such a drastic, you know, like really change his uh, changing his ethics and morals. And look, people can change a hundred percent. Can gods change? Who's to say? <laughs> well, gods are stories we tell ourselves, yep. and I think that's the the beautiful. The, you know, I talk about the show a lot, right? I love writing Easter egg videos for the show because it's not just oh, there's Captain America's shield. It's also it does a great job of incorporating not just like the the where and the who of Norse mythology, but the why of Norse mythology and the what. And the way the show took this concept of Norse mythology and Loki and loops, and they just said, let's make a show out of that. That's our theme. And they've run with it. And this season, I just love how beautifully they've woven that together to tell this story. Colton, how about you? Like, when you watch this show, even though timey-wimey stuff frightens you, you, um, are you into, like, where these characters are going? Do you buy Loki's transformation? Oh yeah, I I love Loki's transformation, and I I loved his transformation over the years from Thor to Avengers, and then eventually to what happens in Infinity War. I, I mm-hmm. love the growth of that character, and so when they announced, okay, we're doing a Loki series, and it's the Loki that teleports away with the Tesseract uh, in the like 2012 when after the first Avengers movie, my fear was, oh my God, they're doing away with all of that mm-hmm. crucial character development. They're just going back to when he was a, when he was a dick. So I, I was worried about that. But with season one, I think even, and this is extremely impressive, in season one, episode one, the way yeah. they were able to just completely change his character and it didn't feel like, just like, you know, rushed or anything. The way that they showed him his life, what happens, the way that they had him admit that it's all just an act. I I thought it was done beautifully and they were able to encompass like 10 years of character development from the MCU into not just one season of television, but really that one episode, you see that same growth translated into this new version of Loki. And you kind of realize that it's not that he changed. He's always been this way. He just didn't mm-hmm. think that he had the option to to be the hero. You know, he he was going down his uh, sacred timeline destiny of being the villain. But with season one of Loki, 
he, he finally realized I, I can be something different. I can be who I actually want to be. So yeah, I, I've been really happy with the character development with him, Mobius, Sylvie. I, I think this show, what it does great is the characters. Yeah, and uh, the way they did that was brilliant because they just had Loki watch MCU movies. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. and that made Loki become an audience proxy because we've seen the same movies. And as soon as we feel like we are a character, we automatically empathize with them and we'll forgive them doing horrible things. If you'd yeah. like to see an example, watch The Sopranos, <laughs> watch Breaking Bad, watch any of those shows. I just I do started look at The Sopranos. <laughs> Congratulations. I, no, no, no. I wish, I wish I could be in your <laughs> shoes. It's fantastic. I've seen it through I don't know how many times. Um, Heather, when we look at this show, though, and we, you know, speaking of like MCU connections and watching old movies and things like that, it is when we take a step back and we start to think, okay, so where is, where is this tapestry leading to? It seems like if we get into Avengers, the Kang Dynasty, and this is a lot of heavy lifting for somebody to do, you know? As somebody who's worked in comic books, because now we're getting into the, the thing where I think the, this new phase, the multiverse saga, is more like... I think the, 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 the Infinity Saga was a bit more, just to talk in comic book terms, was a bit more like the first Marvel Secret Wars, a bit more like Contest of Champions, where there might be tie-in issues, but you didn't have to read them, or Infinity Gauntlet, you know, was like that. Yeah. Now we're getting into, uh, like, Original Sin. That's exactly. I was like, it, it, it feels like Original Sin comic yeah. era to me, 100%. Well, and just to explain to everybody watching who maybe doesn't read comics, and shame on you, uh, Marvel and all these companies, right, they do these big crossovers, which are fun, and they're great, and they're big summer events, but they sometimes get to a point where to understand them, you have to buy all the other books in the line, where the main book should stand on its own, but the other book should support it. Do you think that's happening in the MCU? Are we going to get to these movies and be like, what in the hell is happening? I don't have Disney+. Plus. What is going on? I think it's already there a little bit, you know? It, oh, it's, dear. It's not... <laughs> it's not... I would say original sin level, and uh, for the for those again who who don't read comics, there was um, just a, for instance, I, this was before I was working at Marvel and and just pure innocent comic fandom days. Uh, I wasn't reading the event. Really, the only book Marvel book I was like picking up every month was Deadpool, um, and I'm reading the lovely Jerry Duggan Brian Pussain storyline. And all of a sudden, there's this issue where Deadpool is not Deadpool, and he's wearing a monk and he monk's outfit, yeah. and he can't car carve a turkey because that's violent. And like all again, it's you're missing you're missing an episode. Right, like there right. there's something that happens, and no one is telling me what happened. And then the next episode, it's continuing the you know the story from the right. previous one. It was right, we should say Jason Aaron did a great job of weaving it yes. into. Yes. Uh, we're okay. This, this is wrong. Yes. Wrong show. Wrong show. Yes. We, yes, we yes, yes talk. So, <laughs> you can talk Jason Aaron comics for a long time. Yes. Um, anyways, but, but all of that, MCU. <laughs> all of that to say, like, you know, that has definitely been my fear with the television shows, and and I think we're, you know, I think multiverse of madness is really where we're starting to see it happen. Mm -hmm. um, you know, quantum mania, right? They're they're referencing events and characters and things that happened not in the movies um mm -hmm. and now you know especially in loki um again why i was very interested in this season with the kang of it all is how much of kang are we building in this television show you know rather than for Infinity Gauntlet, right, all the Thanos stuff was happening in Guardians or post credit scenes, mm -hmm. you know, little bit in every single movie, but it all happened on the big screen. Whereas, you know, who knows if we're getting Loki season three before King Dynasty, but if if this season ends on some big setup moment for King Dynasty and then we get to Kang Dynasty, and Kang is already in this position, and this thing is already happening. You know, it's it's. Mm -hmm. I, I'm I'm really. It, it makes me nervous. I I hope we don't get to that point. I I hope, you know, I I do hope that Kevin Feige and and the powers that be at the studios are keeping this in mind. But I do worry again about how much story is being put out there and how much more story is still being put out there mm -hmm. uh, before these films. Uh, it, it could get messy. 
Well, maybe that's one reason why maybe what we're seeing here is the original origin for Kang slash Victor Timely. So it can just exist over here, something we haven't seen. But that may also be may also be a good idea just to destroy the TVA at the end of this, like yeah. break the loop. So when Kang Dynasty happens, we don't know what's going to happen. And if you have all this other knowledge from Loki, great. The only problem I can see happening is when Loki shows up in a suit and tie in the, sh in the, in the movies, people are going to be like, he died, right? Didn't, yeah. he, didn't he die? Like, that's the thing where it's going to take a bit of exposition. What they've done very well, though, and this goes back to presenting the shows from a point of view character, you didn't have to have seen Guardians or the Avengers no. post credit scene. When Infinity War came around and uh, everybody was scared of Thanos, when Bruce Banner tells Tony, this is it, this is the guy, and he's, the Hulk is scared, because we have that audience proxy. You know, if we have that character, I think we'll be fine. Colton, do you think we're going to have, like, is, is the new Loki going to be our audience proxy going forward? Like, how are they going to bring this all home into a film? Well, I'm a little more optimistic, I guess, in the sense that I think everything's going to be okay. I think if you go into Kang Dynasty, I don't, I'm hopeful that you will not have to have seen Loki. I, I think what they're going to be able to do, at least I hope, is if you've seen Loki, that's awesome. Here, you have so much knowledge about these characters and things that have happened, and you can appreciate the film even more. But it's also important to design the film in a way to where if you haven't seen that stuff, it doesn't matter. You, you may not feel as, you know, conflicted on the, uh, uh, the, on Kang's heart and, you know, why he's having to do what he's doing. You might, you might view him as just more of a, a big bad with no compassion for him whatsoever, but that's okay. So I, I'm hoping that that's what they'll do with, with this series is that if you've seen it, that's great. If you haven't, it's okay. But we, we'll hold your hand. We got you. In terms of like bringing Loki in, I do think that we are going to see Thor at some point, maybe toward the end of this season. Really? And definite, yeah, I, I think cool. they, they've, they've yeah. got to they've got to reconnect the brothers. I mean, Thor and Loki. I mean, they're a package deal for me. So I do think we're mm -hmm. going to see that. I there is, oh my God, the the opportunity for Thor to be like. Oh, jeez. <laughs> you know, like, it's not yeah, going to be surprising. Well, which Thor? Is it a multiversal Thor? You know, right. we, we already saw Throg, so who knows? Right. You know? I, I want it to be 616 Thor, who, who has seen Excuse his me? brother die. I'm sorry. 199. Oh, I'm sorry. I want it to be 199999 Thor, uh, who, has seen, who has seen his brother die in his arms. And when Loki walks in, I don't want it to be, you know, like this big emotional scene. At first, I just want it to be like, I, I knew you weren't dead. Like, just like this funny oh, thing. Oh, this again? This yeah. again? Yeah. 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 Oh, and, what a shock. Is it Tuesday? Yeah. And then they can <laughs> embrace each other in a hug. And if you haven't seen Loki, if you're just a general audience member, I don't think you're going to be confused because Loki yeah. has always done this. He's always died and True. he's always come back. He did it in the first Thor. He fell into a black hole. He comes back. He did it in Thor, the Dark World, died, come back. It, he's done this a million times. And I think the general audience has an understanding of maybe they don't know the, the, the details of different timelines, multiverse, how all that works. But they mm -hmm. do have a general understanding. Like if I were to ask my mom, my mom understands, oh, yeah. Andrew Garfield, he's that Spider-Man, and that's a different thing. Sure. And Tom Holland is that Spider-Man, and that's a different thing. It, she understands the concept of that's a different universe, that's a different universe. I, I think the general movie-going audience understands that, and I think that is why No Way Home was such an important film, because it kind of spoon-fed that to the more general audience of this is how that works. Yeah, so I, I think do that, think it's going to be okay. I think this movie can do that, too, like simply by having Loki tell Thor bad bad guy bad things very bad i have seen yeah. time and space unravel yes. this guy's bad if they do yeah. that i think they'll be just fine but that I does agree. take us into uh, my favorite part of this where we get to talk about theories i got a really great theory i want to talk about in just a bit about ravona and Ms. minutes and whatever the hell the secret was miss <laughs> minutes was talking about and we have another video coming out tomorrow where we explore that in even more depth but heather do you got any theories on you know halfway through this season how the hell is this going to end what's what's going to happen next happily ever after right that's the obvious no, sure. I, I, I don't have any specific theories that I can, you know, log on pitch you right now, but I just, I have this feeling that Obi is at the center of everything. I think he is the key to everything, mm -hmm. um, in this season and the key, you know, when we met Victor Timely, right? Who does he mention? Gets a shout out in the manual. Exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. and that to me, you know, Obi is, oh, we're going to die, you know? 
uh, in the previous episode when the other uh, t- TVA person, whose name I forget, but like has him sign the book. Yes. Yeah. Um, and is so excited that, you know, you're the person, all of this stuff. I'm just like, this guy who seems just like goofy and silly and cute and adorable. I'm like, there's something way deeper and more to him. Who doesn't appear to have had his mem- his mind wiped. No. So and I'm getting that's, that impression too. Exactly. Yeah. And so, but who did he not remember? He didn't remember Loki, right? Exactly. And that's yeah. because Loki it's is true. the glitch in all of this. Um, and, and so yeah. I think Obi really is the key to whatever is going to unwind everything this season. And I think we're going to get that. How many episodes is this season? Six. It's six. So I think that'll probably come next episode Ooh. yeah it could be end of end of four so then end of four five. And if it follows the five. structure of, of the, the yeah, previous, previous season yeah, yeah. i'm excited because i love kihu kwan in this role so much he's so like in over his head but charming and smiles the entire time colton what about you i know you wrote the video we have coming up tomorrow about ravona so i don't want you to spoil that but uh you got any other theories ob related or otherwise I hope you guys are wrong about OB. I love him so much. <laughs> I'm but not saying I, he's a villain. I'm just, I think he's you yeah, know, at the center of all this. I, yeah, I've been, you know, our own um, Brianna McLarty, she mentioned that, I think, in one of our talkbacks. And I, I've seen a lot of that about OB being at the center. So I, I hope if he is at the center, it's kind of like a against his will kind of thing. I, I hope he's not like a mwahaha, like I'm, <laughs> I serve he who remains kind of thing. Um, I've got a theory to kind of throw out there. In the season finale of the first season, He Who Remains is giving his spiel about, oh, there was a variant who lived in the 31st century, that was me, I met my other variants, and then I I stumbled upon this Eliath (laughs) cloud monster, Mm -hmm. and uh, I I used him to, you know, eat all the other timelines and put ours in order. He kind of just glossed over that, and with us finding out that Victor Timely is maybe, like, actually Mm -hmm. the he who remains variant that right there tells me okay well maybe he was lying right there already he's a con man yeah he's a con man exactly so and you know we've talked about before the whole thing's in an ouroboros it's happening again and again and again effect is actually the cause you know and the, the cause and effect work backwards i think that it would be really cool if we find out that Eliath, the way that he who remains is able to use Eliath is because we see Sylvie or maybe Loki who has now learned how to do this enchant Eliath like they did in the season one finale and if we actually could see that happen in the past with like Victor Timely or whoever as they enchant Eliath and use him to start consuming or arranging these other timelines I think it'd be really cool to then go back and watch season one and be like oh he kind of glossed over the part where your future selves helped him do that. So I I think that would be cool. Now I cannot wait to tell you all my theory. Colton, Heather, thanks very much for joining me. Follow them on all the social media stuff linked below. So the big tease at the end of the episode was this. It was foolish of him to make an enemy out of someone who knows all his secrets. I know a really big one about you. Oh yeah, what's she talking about? Well, buddy, I think the comics have a big clue here. You see, in the comics, Ravona Renslayer is the star-crossed lover of Kang the Conqueror. She started off as a princess from the future, Kang fell in love with her, and she died. And then he, like, placed her in suspended animation, and she was revived, like, after he died. And then, in a later comic, we see the origin of young Kang growing up throughout the timeline, always encountering a reincarnated version of Ravona, and something always happens to prevent them from being together. It's a long story short, but you get the gist. I think, in the MCU, that Kang has the same affection for her, like we saw on the boat with their little hand touch and we heard in the recording here Professor Rinsley you are quite a marvel I will be proud to lead with you but Ravona wants to be close to power, and Kang does not have partners. We also have this weird thing where Miss Minutes is jealous of Ravona and has this crush on Kang. Your toy instead of what I could have been your girl. <laughs> Like this creepy AF shirt in our merch store, get yours today. So, here's my theory. Miss Minutes is based on Ravona's personality engrams, similar to how Ultron was based on Tony Stark's and how Tony Stark based Jarvis on his childhood butler, also named Jarvis. I think that Kang wanted to be with Ravona, but he could never love her as an equal, so he killed her, probably directly after the recording that we hear in the first episode of this show, but then afterwards, he took Ravona's brainwaves and made her into an AI. 
Now, he let the AI develop so it could be intelligent, similar to Ravona, but never able to challenge him because she lacked a body. I mean, think about it. Miss Minute says to him that if you gave me a body, we could rule together. If I had a body, we could truly lead together. It's a very Ravona-like way of thinking. I was just thinking it sounds like someone I know. Now, we actually have a video coming out tomorrow where we explore this theory in more detail, so be sure to subscribe and ring the bell so you don't miss it. Also, big thanks to our guests, Colton Ogburn and Heather Antos. And guys, let me know your thoughts and theories down in the comments below. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe, smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.